Hey guys, Jack here. I uh, wanted to do a quick update on some stuff going on at the Miyagi. You can see the mouse melon's doing really well. It still ain't producing. Uh, I wanted to just start out here, even though the light's kind of in the you know, low sun angle early in the day, it's kind of messing the shot up. Just to show you how big this uh, potato vine's got, I threw out a challenge to my buddy David on Facebook last night, our kind of our daily cocktail challenge. You can come up with a cooler drink for the night. And uh, I've also included, since I was out here with it, hashtag my potato vine is bigger than yours and he he posted his drink and he said he scoffs at my vine well all he could see in that picture was about this dig this and this all started from three um three slips that were placed in this bed now you might think this is an advocacy to do this you can see it's it's all the way up in there and crawling across there probably in another couple of days be up in those trees uh an advocacy to to grow uh sweet potatoes in ebb and flow beds it is not this is not a good idea. Uh, I have everything shut off right now so you don't have to listen to the noise, but I don't know if you can see in there, but there are root hairs everywhere. Uh, I'm gonna have to, if I decide to keep this ebb and flow bed out here, and I don't know that I'm going to, I'm gonna have to completely yank that all out. Um, the, the root activity of these things is insane, and that's why it's growing like this. Check this out. <laughs> I don't even know how these leaves are getting enough sunlight back in here to stay green like this. But it does tell me that maybe we can grow sweet potato in a lot more shaded environments than we think we can. All right, let's come on the other side to show you what I really wanna show you. So I had mentioned that I have this uh, flowering gourd. You see the vine here coming out of this wicking bed, going up this tree and I've been waiting for it to produce and sometimes things are right in front of you and you just don't see them. Um, check that out. There's two up there. One's kind of small. I might climb up there today and pick the little one. Uh, I think I'll let the other two go for uh, for seed because the seed was hard to find and kind of expensive. And my understanding of these gourds is like that's bigger than you want it to be if you're going to eat it. Like that's borderline. And that bigger one up there, it looks about the same size, but it's much bigger because it's way back there, um, is, uh, is way past it. And you really want to cut them up and use them as like a stir fry vegetable when they're about the size of that little one. So maybe we'll try that tonight with whatever we eat. But I just think it's kind of cool that that one little wicking bed there uh, has now got vines. Look, it's all the way to here. So that vine splits off right there, comes around, you got one of them here. And this is still going. And uh, so it's climbed through the pear tree, through the support species black locust tree. And now it's getting into this peach tree and to probably hit the ground and take off running over that way. I don't know how long those vines get, but I mean, I gotta say that's the top of that vine up there is more than 10 feet. That's about as high as the top of a basketball backboard. So that's, that's around 12 feet. Plus you had to get there. So there's another six. So let's call that 18 feet up and come in about another 10 foot down at least right now, probably more. Uh, so we're looking at 28 to 30 feet of total length on that vine, all being supported by this one little wicking bed over here. Now these wicking beds are going to go away. Um, I'm going to do some redesign on this so that it's more accessible. You can see when I'm out here seeing what I got, I got my little fishing pole here. I got this one little spot I can get to here. I've talked about this before. I want to make this more a conversational area, but uh, it really is beautiful. Again, I have the pump off just because the water sounds great when you're sitting out here listening to it on purpose. But when you're doing a video, I found it to be very distracting. So I uh, just want to give you an update there. Also, the uh, Thai water spinach that was buried by whatever this weed is. If anybody knows what this weed is, please tell me. This stuff, it loves aquatic systems. And I'm thinking it might actually be a really great uh, species to do, to grow on purpose just for composting because of the biomass it accumulates is huge. Uh, but when I had the ducks, they didn't eat it. Um, I've done a little kind of, you know, burnish the leaf and taste it. And uh, it, I don't think it's toxic, but it don't taste it. It's nothing I would eat. But uh, this stuff, I'd have to pull these out today and just prune them all out. But that Thai water spinach is taking off. And uh, you can see the sweet potato is going crazy. These are two of my favorite plants to grow in our hot summers in aquatic systems. And I have a plan. The, the wife is not thrilled with the plan. Uh, I'm probably going to put in a, a three foot by three foot by two foot deep uh, exoterra uh, terrarium in my office in a bioactive system with probably a snake in there. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Maybe a pair of snakes. Something like Baron's Racer, something kind of cool. 
uh, with you know isopods and uh, springtails down in the substrate and growing live plants and stuff like that. So I have that life in my office, and so it's low maintenance. And Dorothy doesn't really hate snakes or anything, but I used to be a snake reader, and I had over 50 snakes in my office at one time, and that wasn't counting babies when I was you know having hatchlings come out and stuff. So she's like, oh no, not again, roll her eyes, but. Uh, one of the reasons I want to do it is this stuff, and sweet potatoes, you know, just grows beautifully from clones. You can just root this stuff, and I mean, it's probably, you see that one touch of water down there, it's probably rooting already, and that wasn't even touching the water yesterday, it's grown so fast. Well, within that exoterra, I can take cuttings every year. Uh, if I could probably, once I'll have to do it one time, and I'll just keep them alive throughout forever, uh, recloning them, but for these, and uh, the sweet potato, and uh, another plant I'm growing this year called water celery. And every year I have to either get a new supply of seed or I have to make slips or, or buy slips or whatever if I run out of time. Well, right there, uh, these three plants would just be kept in perpetuity. And uh, again, they're, they're edible plants that we use a lot of. Uh, we haven't used this as much this year as we uh, did previous year because we didn't have as much of it grow due to some changes we made. But, uh, you know, last year I was growing so much of this, I was feeding half a bushel of it to the ducks every two weeks. So I think this is a, a good plan, and uh, actually on this podcast today, I'm going to be talking about this right here, aquaculture. You know, there's some aquaponics elements in this, but I'm going to talk about it from a standpoint of all you want to do is have something beautiful and productive in your backyard that gives you some stuff to eat, including fish, uh, how to source your fish, all kinds of stuff like that, and... Uh, you know, doing it without it being a complicated aquaponics system. Because I love aquaponics, but it does become complicated. There's ways to do this, like this Miyagi pond, as we call it. And you can get rid of these elements. It doesn't have to be complicated. All of this concept that, you know, filtering has to be complicated. It, it really doesn't. Uh, it's not hard. If you don't, if you put enough water in and you don't overstock, simple surface vegetation, plants, plants in pots like this on shelving, They'll do all the filtering you need with a recirculating pump to keep the water moving. And uh, you can do all kinds of cool things. And even if, if you wanted to, without it even being aquaponics, you know, you could set up a little rack over here with some raised beds and just plumb in a line to do a static wicking bed just with a float valve. And then you throw a float valve in here and plumb this in from your water source and you'd never have to touch it other than to feed your fish and to look at it. Anyway... I came out here this morning because I didn't know what I was going to talk about today, and I decided to talk to the fish. And I said, fish, what should we talk about today on the podcast? Because it's Tuesday, and i got to come up with my own subject. And they said, well, dummy, talk about us. So that's what we're going to do. If you've never seen my podcast, you can find it. You can use our short domain to get there, tspc.co. That's not a mistake, tspc.co. Take you right to the survivalpodcast.com. <laughs> 